So the talk will be on my view and the data on check inhibitors in PV and MF. We don't have too much data on ET now. Now, the significant milestone of trials in MF have been the COMFORT trials. And they have been published back to back by uh, Serge and Claire Harrison, 2012. And the primary endpoint of this study was the reduction of splenomegaly more than 35% uh, measured by MRI. And as you can see in both trials, the endpoint was fulfilled. In the COMFORT 1, the endpoint was uh, at week 24. It was uh, reached in 42% of the Rooks patients versus 1% in the uh, placebo patients, this was a placebo control trial, and in the COMFORT 2, which was a trial against best available therapy, the endpoint was met at the defined endpoint week 48, and it was 48% in the Rooks uh, group that reached it, and zero in the best available therapy group. And in addition, it was shown that uh, in the Rooks group, there was a significant improvement of symptoms. So with this in mind, we had uh, another analysis uh, three years later by Alessandro Vanucci, uh, which focused on the overall survival in uh, both trials. And they had uh, collected the 300 uh, Rooks patients and compared it with the placebo, uh, placebo and best available therapy patients. And what they found was in this uh, pooled analysis a reduction in the risk of death with ruxolitinib by 35%. Uh, I have to mention that this was, survival was not an endpoint, a primary endpoint in, in the trial, but nevertheless it was an uh, interesting issue. And uh, if you pretend uh, not to do a um, uh, crossover, then you can calculate with a rank-preserving structural failure time analysis, uh, which I don't know, of course. I'm uh, happy to can speak this without problems. Uh, but with this test, you can uh, show that the difference in survival would be even greater. Anyway, the survival uh, advantage is obvious, but it was not the primary endpoint. Again, I have to stress this. In this analysis, Another issue uh, was very important and firstly addressed that was the significance of spleen volume and survival. And uh, I had um, visited uh, several administrations in Germany and their question when uh, ruxolitinib came up was always, is it really important to address splenomegaly? There are no data at that time saying that uh, splenomegaly is prognostically important. And in this analysis, it was clearly shown that there is a relation between the spleen volume and survival. In fact, uh, the authors could say that the risk of death was 1.14 uh, times uh, higher for each additional 5 deciliter in spleen volume at baseline. So this was a very interesting aspect from this analysis. Now, what about the long-term findings here, exemplarily the COMFORT 2 trial um, published by Claire uh, one year ago, a median follow-up now more than four years. And what we can see is that uh, the spleen responders have their response at five years with a proportion of 50%. So 50% are keeping their uh, spleen response. What uh, uh, was seen uh, too was a reduction in check 2 positivity in more than 20% in allele burden, but we don't know what it means. So the significance of this observation is not clear, and the same applies to the other observation, the improvement in bone marrow biopsy uh, in 16% and 32% uh, stabilization, so 50% response if you like, Interesting observation, but again, the question is, what does it clinically mean? We will see this in later reviews, hopefully. But what was seen in this long-term finding was uh, grade 3 and 4 anemia in 22% of the patients and a thrombocytopenia in 15%, and very important because immunosuppression is a problem with CHECK2 inhibitors, pneumonia in 6%. We will follow this later in my talk. Now it's very clear from the COMFORT trial that uh, we treat uh, 
the high risk and the intermediate two risk patients with splenomegaly and symptoms. But the question now arises in the literature and in the expert groups, should we be treating lower risk MF patients with a CHECK2 inhibitor? Now, here you see the data we have, and they are very scanty. We have two data sources, three, but these are the two important. This is the CHUMP trial, and in the CHUMP trial, 161 low-risk and intermediate one-risk patients were reviewed uh, according to their response, and the response was very good, and the robust trial. So from these data, there is a suggestion that probably there is a place for CHECK2 inhibitors in patients with low and intermediate one-risk if they have a splenomegaly and symptoms. But these are the only data. And this and many other questions were discussed by an European and Italian expert panel. Um, and uh, the aim of this panel was to improve uh, one of three or three clinical outcome parameters in the Rooks treatment. It was splenomegaly, of course, disease-related symptoms, and survival. For survival, the expert panel found the data impressive, but not too impressive enough to say that survival is the first target for the ruxolitinib use. But ruxolitinib was strongly recommended for high-risk and intermediate two-risk patients with a severe splenomegaly and with severe symptoms. So again, it was stressed by the panel that in the high-risk and intermediate two-risk situation with splenomegaly and severe symptoms, there's a clear place of ruxolitinib for myelofibrosis. Uh, but it was also addressed that there are some caveats, that risk factors for infection. Uh, and we know that there are a variety of infections seen with the immun immunosuppressive effect of ruxolitinib. It's not too much, but it was enough that the panel advised to look for hepatitis B and C screening and, uh, if suspected, for mycobacteria tuberculosis. Also, it is very rare. And again, you have to keep in mind that there is a risk for bleeding with a CHECK2 inhibition. And especially if there are low platelets, you have to look for antiplatelet therapy, anticoagulation, older age, and other risk factors if you use uh, CHECK inhibitors in general and ruxolitinib, especially because this is licensed. Now, um, I want to end up this part of myelofibrosis and check inhibition with um, this uh, recommendation by Alessandro Vanucci for the European community, saying clearly that there is a place, as mentioned, for ruxolitinib in the high-risk situation, but also um, letting a space for ruxolitinib use in the lower-risk patients with a question mark, of course, but if there is significant splenomegaly or symptoms, but I have to say the data are at the moment in discussion and we need more data for having clearer statements. Now, what about um, CHECK2 inhibition in polycythemia vera? As you have heard by uh, Tiziana Barburi very impressively, we have the low-risk patients, uh, treating them by aspirin and phlebotomy. Also, this can be questioned, as you have heard. We have the high-risk situation, uh, the treatment of hydroxyurea as first-line therapy. Some use interferon. And now we have uh, another situation, a check to inhibition therapy for patients with Pivera in a long-lasting disease having had hydroxyurea refractory or intolerant disease. Now, what does it mean? And... Uh, this um, term has been addressed by our Spanish colleagues. Uh, they have clearly shown that a resistance or intolerance to hydroxyurea is a severe problem in polycythemia vera because the overall survival time, if you have resistance or intolerance, is a year, a bit more than a year for these patients. So this is a problem, and uh, resistance and intolerance is occurring in about 20% or more of all our Pivera patients. And this leads us to the expression of inadequately controlled disease. You have already heard by Tiziano that inadequately controlled disease is a problem that leads to severe thrombosis, which is one of the cornerstones of Pivera. And what does it mean? It's, of course, hydroxyurea failure, because this is our standard drug. Uh, 
But this is also ongoing phlebotomy. And again, I have to refer to Tiziana's talk here because you can see that there is activation. And if you do phlebotomies, there is a problem. We have the data from the Spanish colleagues. We have this data uh, from uh, Tiziano. They, they are a bit conflicting, but there is a discussion on that. And also here again, palpable spleen is a problem of uncontrolled polycythemia vera, making a lot of symptoms you can see here as has been addressed uh, by Ruben Mesa and Gaia Holler in many publications. So in this situation, the response one study was designed, and again, the um, setting was resistance or intolerance to hydroxyurea according to defined criteria of the ELN, uh, still requiring phlebotomy, having splenomegaly, and these patients were randomized to ruxolitinib and best available therapy. And very important, the primary endpoint was a composite endpoint, a composite endpoint of both hematocrit control, because this is important in polycythemia vera, as you've heard, and the reduction of splenomegaly, here again measured by MRI, and the target was analog to the COMFORT trials, a more than 35% reduction in spleen volume by MRI at week 32. And you know the outcome, and I show you now the 80-week follow-up data because they are very consistent and have been published by Serge in Hematologica one year ago. And as you can see, that due to the lack of efficacy, efficacy most patients in the best available therapy arm crossed over uh, soon after or uh, before, the, uh, soon after the week 32. In fact, uh, no patients are still in the best available therapy arm due to mostly lack of efficacy. Now, what about the durability of the primary response? So, composite endpoint, splenomegaly control, and control of hematocrit is excellent, as you can see. The probability of maintaining the primary response is at the week, uh, uh, 80th week, um, 92%, 92%. So very consistent data. And uh, this also applies to the control of splenomegaly. Here you see the best available therapy arm, and here the ruxolitinib arm, where you can see a constant decrease, in fact, uh, of the 40% uh, of patients in this study in the ruxolitim arm who really reached the endpoint of a more than a 35% reduction in MRI and spleen volume, none, none lost their response at week 80. Now, there was another trial which was uh, a bit uh, motivated by the FDA. They wanted to redo this response trial again. Uh, with the only difference of a non-palpable spleen. So the same setting, the only difference is now the spleen uh, should not be palpable in this. The design was the same, Rooks versus best available therapy. And of course, the primary endpoint cannot be uh, control of spenomegaly because there is no significant spenomegaly. The primary endpoint was hematocrit control at week 28 now. And as you can see, this primary endpoint was MET2 in the RESPONSE2 trial, so excellent hematocrit control, and it didn't matter whether the patients were hydroxyurea resistant or intolerant, uh, the result was the same. And the same applied to symptom control, uh, it was excellent in the ruxolitinum arm. So now we have two trials, two controlled trials, showing clearly that in the hydroxyurea resistant and intolerant situation in polycythemia vera, ruxolitinib is much more effective uh, over best available therapy. So now the, my title was uh, check to inhibitors. What, what about the other check to inhibitors? And there's a bit of a disappointment because as you know, um, there are only some check inhibitors mentioned here, but we had the fedratinib uh, and the uh, trial was uh, closed uh, because of Wernicke encephalopathy, and the program was stopped, unfortunately, uh, some weeks before, three weeks before it should have been licensed. And we had the Lily compound, uh, 
uh, we took part in the study and I regret it until today because this was a very effective uh, 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 check inhibitor. I have still some patients treated with the drug, nevertheless Lily decided to stop the program. And now there are only two inhibitors in, that's the momelotinib and you have probably seen the data uh, shown by Ayala Teferi at the ASH. Uh, showing that uh, anemia control is quite good, but we have a problem uh, with uh, peripheral neuro neuropathy in a lot of patients, and uh, that the effectiveness in, of momelotinib uh, concerning splenomegaly and symptom control is, is not better concerned with ruxolitinib from the data we have. And uh, concerning pacritinib, which was uh, used in the setting of uh, uh, low platelets, and it was very promising because a lot of MF patients have low platelets and we urgently need a drug in this situation. So it was effective, but we had a stop by the FDA due to bleedings and myocardial infarctions. Now the program is reactivated again, but as we have seen from the persist data, the effectiveness of uh, pacritinib is uh, good concerning splenomegaly, but not as good as ruxolitinib concerning control of symptoms. So there are many question marks on the future of check inhibitors, unfortunately, I have to say, because we need new drugs, of course. Mm, so uh, where is the future? Probably combination therapies, and this is just an example of a few combination uh, studies. There is the German study with pomalidomide uh, showing uh, effectiveness in 20%. Though that's not uh, too much, but it's not ne ne neglectable. We have the activities of our friends in Denmark with interferon in MF and PV. It's ongoing. Combinations with azacitinine and BKM and others um, showing that this is effective, but there are also many side effects. So the story is still open and uh, there is no solution at the moment for these problems. So. I like to conclude what is my view on the current future use of check inhibitors for PV and MF because for ET there are only scanty data I haven't shown you for this. So there's a German trial running at the moment uh, in our German group uh, um, making a randomization between best available therapy and ruxolitinib but we have to wait for the data and this will take a long time. So we have established check inhibitor therapy with ruxolitinib in myelofibrosis, as I've shown you, and in polycythemia vera. Uh, in polycythemia vera, only for the hydroxyurea resistant and intolerant situation, not for the primary therapy. And data I have not shown because of uh, uh, time problems is the rux use pre-transplant in MF, uh, which is quite established. And we now have the long-term results for NF but also for PV coming up, which are very reassuring and showing that uh, ruxolitinib is effective and um, has side effects that are well known and there are no new concerns. Although I have to say, we have to look for the infectious complications and later we will have a session here moderated by Tiziano about um, optimizing therapy and I will go further in details about the infectious complications so we have to keep this in mind. Also there are new, no new signals but this has to be followed of course and as I said uh, for ET uh, there are only scanty data and probably the combination is, is a new issue and a solution but we urgently new, need new check inhibitors of course and with this I thank you very much for your attention.